collection of linked stories. So the characters move in and out of the same stories. They come together uh, to form a novel that's set in a small Midwestern city, 1967 and 1968. And uh, the events in the book culminate uh, in some pretty significant uh, political happenings during that particular time. Uh, at the center of the stories, and most of the characters live or work in a certain neighborhood. So they, they move in and out of each other's houses, they appear at each other's churches and stores, etc. And at the center of all of this is the Jones family, which lives on a particular block. Uh, it's a husband, a wife, and three sons. The oldest son's name's Ed. And uh, I'm going to read a part in which he has an experience. It's a very racially polarized city uh, based somewhat on the city that I grew up in, uh, St. Louis. It's a fictionalized version. But in St. Louis, there was a south side and a north side. The south side was all white. The north side was all black. And for people of my generation, I was born in the very early 60s. It was possible to grow to adulthood without ever setting foot on the south side. So in this particular uh, instance, Ed has had an occasion to be on the south side on business. And uh, he's 17 years old, and he's on his way back to the north side. So this is a little of his experience, uh, very briefly, coming home. On the bus, Ed took note of the half dozen or so black ladies carrying large shopping bags. The bags held the clothes they were required to wear when cleaning white people's houses. As soon as they got off work, they couldn't wait to put on outfits that better suited their real selves. So, though their feet were sore and their backs were tired, they sat upright in their dignified dresses, hats atop their heads like crowns. Ed recognized his grandmother in their careworn faces. Reuben's mom, Nana, had spent a lifetime doing day work, as it was politely called, until crippling arthritis forced her into a painful retirement. Ed's reverie was interrupted by the bus driver. Hell's fire, he shouted from behind the wheel. In the distance, a row of police cruisers stretched end to end, sirens flashing. A solitary policeman standing in the path of the bus waved it to the curb. The driver pulled over and the cop got on. <coughs> Mayor's orders, the cop barked. I'm shutting you down. The driver was incredulous. Shutting me down? Whatever for? Urban unrest, the cop said with a flourish. No buses north of Manchester for the foreseeable future. Everybody off, please. One of the day workers raised her hand. The cop pointed at her patiently like a kindergarten teacher. How will we get home? Best of luck, ma'am, the cop replied. Tonight, you're on your own. Ed and the others got off and stood by the side of the road. At the gas station on the corner, a jack leg work crew was attaching plywood to the windows. Shirtless and lean, the workers were so tan and muscled that they looked like black men. Ed approached them and discovered they were not. But they weren't unfriendly, just busy. As they hurried about their work, a few other stragglers from the bus joined Ed on the station's lot. Hurricane coming? An old woman asked. One of the workers, a cigarette hanging from his lips, turned and answered her. His tone was surprisingly polite. Might could be, ma'am, he said. Something like that. Ed and the others stared at the man. He took a long drag off his cigarette, pinched it, and tossed it aside. Y'all haven't heard, have you? Ed shook his head. Heard what? Some damn fool killed Martin Luther King, he said. Shot him down dead in Memphis. Ed gasped. The wind sucked from his body. One woman began to sob quietly. Another commenced to crying, high-pitched and keening. Yet another sat down quickly as if punched by an invisible assailant. Lord Jesus, 